and that means I'm 96 years old if you want to figure it out and I what was the next question in which war did you serve it was the second world war what did you do I was with the American Red Cross and when um, I went in uh, in 1945 right after Japan had really capitulated in fact I was in training in the American University in Washington DC for the Red Cross when that happened then I went to Camp Pickett Virginia and from Camp Pickett I was sent overseas leaving from Boston with 68 other Red Cross women and one thing I think is very amusing in my training was one of the uh, instructors said when you get overseas you are going to be extremely popular because there are so few American women there but don't think you've become a beauty it's just that you've lost your competition and we had to remember that because we were very popular we spent um, 28 days at sea going across the Atlantic down through the Mediterranean around the Suez and around and up on the uh, eastern side of India to Calcutta and then we were sent out to several different places my assignment at, well I stayed in Calcutta for a few days but my assignment was Kanchapara in India which is about I don't know the distance but I we it probably was about 80 or 90 miles I suppose near the Dum Dum airport if that might be familiar to somebody and um, my job was to fix up an old English lorry that had a uh, door that went down on the side like these things you see at a carnival a food truck and there were three of us assigned to it but first we had to get that thing in running order and cleaned up it was a mess when we got it we had to scrub it down and get it all ready to use and then we kept that supplied and on the road for 24 hours at a replacement depot and we would have to take it well we had to be off long enough to restock but we um, met the men soldiers coming in from CBI the theater of China Burma India when they have to turn in whatever they have to give back to the army and decide what they can keep and principally we were there just to uh, keep them entertained while they had to wait most of it was conversation and food however I never saw a donut till I got to Japan they took the same old dough and made cookies from it and still tasted like a donut but we had coffee and juices and cigarettes lots of cigarettes and the favorite conversation was well where are you from and what did you do before you got here and that kind of thing do you have brothers and sisters and that sort of question but that I uh, I went into Calcutta a lot with the um, it's not USO what's this uh, armed division that entertains the troops army division not OSS that's secret anyway I'll say USO and I worked very closely with a lieutenant who was the head of that we would not only me but the other two people that I was working with would periodically go into Calcutta and try to find groups that would come back to the uh, base like a band or singers or dancers or something of that sort that would just entertain the, the uh, fellas and then we had there was a club on the base where they could go and I guess I never worked in that club but I think they played bingo and cards and 
just a place where they could relax and be entertained. Do you want to ask me anything? Um, just keep going. One thing that I thought was very interesting that I will always remember is that one time when I was in with um, uh, in Calcutta, on our way back, we just saw groups and groups of people who were um, congregating. I should have had a glass of water here. Can we stop at all? When I was in Calcutta trying to or organize for a band to come back to the base, um, groups and groups of people were gathering. So I said to Dave, let's pull the Jeep over and see what's going on. And somebody said, the Mahatma is going to speak. So we thought that was worth stopping for. So we walked across into this field and they were separating men and women. I grabbed a hold of him. We were both in uniform. And I said, no way am I going to leave you in this crowd. So we went and stood in the back. And it was ex the picture was exactly what you saw if you ever saw the um, movie on Mahatma Gandhi. Exactly. He walked in in a procession and went up with these bamboo steps to a bamboo platform, a little tiny microphone in front of him with the wires that went all different ways. And he spoke. Of course, we couldn't understand cause, because it was all in Hindu, Hindi. And so, um, but while he was speaking, somebody from his entourage came back and said to us, the Mahatma would like to speak to you when this is over. In our youth, we both said, we'll have to be back at the base such and such a time, which I'm sure they would have excused us for. But the, I, I guess we thought we were going to run into him the next day on I think of that so often, and I wonder if this fella named Dave thinks of it too. He came from California, that's all I can remember. Now, you want me to go back and talk? Give us an idea of when and why you joined. Oh, I was living at home just with my father and a housekeeper and teaching school, and life was rather boring. And I happened to go to New York with some friends and a captain of the Navy, a chaplain, sat down and shared, you know, how you put seats together in the railway. And he talked to us the whole way to New York. He said, I can't understand why you girls are not in the service when all the men are overseas. <laughs> and I had been interviewed when I left college because I was a math major they wanted me to go into the wax or something of that sort to decode messages and that, I, I don't know what they wanted me to do, but because I was a math major, they had tried to get me to re be a recruit, but my mother was very ill at the time. And during that time and the time that I left, my mother had passed away. So I was footloose and fancy free and whatever he said to me stuck. So I did go in and apply, and I got into the Red Cross in the summer of 45 and went to Washington, D.C. for my training. Probably should have come first. How was the training? Well, the training was excellent. We had different people talk about um, what, how we should behave, what we should do, what we should not do. And I told you that one story about um, being so popular, which of course was true. And um, let's see, what else did I want to tell you about that? Many different speakers, they told us about cultures in different countries, because at that time, we didn't know where we were going to go. There were, it was a big group of people that were there, many more than the 68 that went over with me. But um, some went to Europe, some went to New Zealand or other places, I suppose. But when they asked me where I'd like to go, I said, any place you want to send me. And I really meant that because um, 
um, I hadn't been too many places. And I also feel that I was very lucky that I went to India, the Philippines, and Japan because those are harder places to visit. Then Europe is rather easy. So I was one of the lucky ones. And is there more in that? How did you feel leaving the home for the first time and going to a different country? Well, I was very thrilled and excited about going. And the fact that um, I knew when I left Boston that I was going to India. And I thought, well, this is going to be a new experience. And really, it was. And I should have said this, I guess, one of the early things. When I'm just talking off the top of my head. But um, one of the oddest things that I saw while I was in Calcutta, and it was one of those first days, I saw coolies. They would take a rag and twist it up and put it on their head like a halo type thing. And they had taken an upright piano, turned it on its back, and there were six coolies running in step, carrying that on their heads, going down Chowringi Street. Never would you see anything like that in America, nor people sitting on a curb cleaning out somebody's ears or cutting hair. or it. And it, of course, this was back in 19... 45, so it was very primitive. It's much more built up at this time. Do you remember any of your instructors or classmates from there? Oh, I, I remember some of the girls that I uh, was with. I was uh, with Katie Rector and, and Barbara Smith and uh, um, Bevelheimer. What was her first name? Irene, Irene Bevelheimer. Because I was a Buckingham, we were always next to each other. So. Now, when you were overseas, how did you stay in touch with your family? Oh, I wrote quite a lot. And fortunately, my sister um, kept all of those letters. And she make, made a beautiful scrapbook for me from things that I would send back. I sent programs from the club and uh, things that we had done, and uh, about certainly about seeing the Mahatma. That was one of the outstanding things, I think. And it, it was it was a joy to do things like the, like my program because I think I was bringing a, a shining bright star occasionally in somebody's life by just cheering them up a little bit. Did you get to see any battles over there? Never. No, I, well, the war was over when I landed. It was over. But they were coming home. One of the things that I remember, um, the fellows at the replacement depot took awfully good care of me. They watched over me like a hawk. And the only time I was ever frightened or scared was when they changed the um, system in the army of sending people home. They would send a whole unit home and one shot. And as I said, we were just that distance from Calcutta where they had, when they were shipped out. But they would, um, a fellow who had just come over to join the unit would turn around and go right back home. Well, that made those that had served longer, angry. And when they changed the system, they had to go down into Calcutta and take men off the ship who thought they were going home. And that was a scary night because they came back mad. And <laughs> they were almost guarding me in my, in my uh, uh, van that I used. But that was, that was the... Uh, it was done in such a, the wrong way, perhaps. But that scared me to death. Did you receive any awards or citations? No, just the, uh, I have a letter from the head of the Red Cross, and she probably has that, thanking me for my service. I still have the um, um, jacket that I wore. 
and I'll tell you about that jacket. And I have a pin from Red Cross, and on the pin it says overseas. But I have no, nothing else. But just the treatment that I had from them over there, I really do appreciate we had to pay for our own meals in the in the uh, army mess. And when I was in um, India, not serving in the uh, club itself, I I served, however, with um, uh, um, servicemen and the um, their officers both. We didn't discriminate. What did I just think of that I was going to say? It'll come to me in a minute. What was, how was the food like? Oh, it was, <laughs> we had an awful lot of that canned fruit of the pears and peaches and comes in a can. You can still buy it here now. That was our dessert, an awful lot. It was mess hall food. And... It we didn't none of us starved, but nothing was really gourmet. <laughs> Did you eat out of the base? Very seldom, very seldom. Oh, when we would f drive into Calcutta, I took an awful lot of tours to people in uh, took the GIs in to tour the burning ghats and the temples and things of that sort. Then eventually, I was moved into Calcutta. Because as the war was, the men were coming less and less, but coming to the depot less and less, they didn't need us. So I w went into Calcutta itself and lived in a uh, beautiful residence there and worked in what they called the Burra Club, B-U-R-R-A, on Chowringi Drive. And that was where the downstairs there was a restaurant. You could come in and buy a meal. Upstairs was a club, and anything that was upstairs, they there was never any charge for. But some GIs say, oh, well, the Red Cross charged me for this or that. But they were in getting a full meal, like any restaurant, when they did that. So I don't like to hear the Red Cross criticized for that. <laughs> then I got a cush job. They sent me to the Victoria Memorial, where there was a swimming pool. And all I had to do was manage the canteen that was there, and make sure that it, it had all the sodas and food and so forth that it needed. And then all I did was just swim all day or talk to the people around the pool. And that was a cush job. Then, eventually, the war was winding down. I wonder if there's anything else I should say about India. Oh, one thing about India is that they made those um, cow patties, which was straw mixed up with cow dung, mm -hmm. and they dried those out on the side of their huts or whatever they were living in, and that smell when they burned them for for uh, was just terrible. Anyway, that's one thing I'll never forget <laughs> about India. Then, um, oh, I started to say, then when they were winding down, I already talked almost an half hour, um, they did uh, go fast. They sent me to the Philippines, thinking that the Philippines, from the Philippines, they were going to send me on to China. But the people in Philippines delayed and delayed and delayed our departure until finally they said they didn't need us in China and I was sent to Japan. But while I was in the Philippines, Red Cross always kept you busy. They handed me a, almost a ream of paper on Corregidor. And almost within 24 hours, I was conducting tours to Corregidor. So whoever took those first trips got a bit of misinformation. <laughs> but I did get smarter. And I was there for about six weeks is all. And then they sent me on to uh, Sendai, Japan. And there we had a huge bank building that was a club. And they made um, donuts there. That's the first donut that I saw 
actually, you could have called me a donut girl because that's really what I was from the beginning. But um, our, uh, servicemen and officers all came into that club to be have a breakfast and so forth. And we'd just move around and chat with different people. And the club upstairs was um, for entertainment. We would have sing-alongs and tours of, of uh, we'd go to the different islands. I've been to Sapporo and I've been all over, practically all over Japan taking tours of GIs. And while I was there, they wanted to have a um, radio broadcast and they wanted a woman's voice announcing. So I was Linda Lee. And I would say, Ohio, everyone, this is Linda Lee calling this morning, playing your favorite tunes. Please phone in if there's something you'd like me to play. But right now we'll play Benny Goodman's something or other. And of course, they knew my voice. As you can tell, it's not a very quiet voice. But they tried to keep it secret and they called me Linda Lee, which was fun. So, as you can see, I've done many, many different things. Do you have anything further to ask? Do you have any stories to tell, anything funny that happened? While I was in Japan, um, I did go to, well, we lived in a Japanese house. The women who were uh, billeted there, we had Japanese help and lived in one of the Japanese homes which uh, we did have cots. They didn't make us sleep on the tatamis. But um, right, we were right across from an Air Force base, uh, 8th. It was the 8th unit. I've forgotten what that number was. But um, I happened to have a, a, a man who had graduated from my college, or Sinus College in Collegeville, Pennsylvania, who was an alumni of there, of the same college. And however I found that, I don't remember. But um, he invited me to come over to his home, which was very interesting. We took pictures and sent them back to our college, which was an interesting thing that happened. But then I was just invited to come to someone's home for a meal. And of course, they always gave you a gift when you went to them. And I have a beautiful scarf at home that they had given me. But it was such an interesting meal because they served everything on such little dishes and many, many different things, even some raw fish, which, of course, sushi I like now. But at that time, I didn't think I was that fond of it. But uh, that was a very interesting experience. And um, we went down to, um, we went into Tokyo quite a lot to, and one time when I went on the train into Tokyo, some old fella, Japanese fella, really, really old, bearded, wanted to talk to me in the worst way, but he couldn't speak English. And of course, I didn't have much Japanese. I had words is about all I and he gave me a jade, a piece of jade that he had hanging around his neck. And uh, it was shaped sort of like a fish hook. And somebody told me that that had been an old fish hook. I don't know. But I've given that to another person now, so I don't have it anymore. But th just little things like that would happen. And they loved to stop and try to speak to you in English. As you can tell, I really, really enjoyed my experience in India more than any other thing that I had done. But I think that's because I thought I was going to China when I left India, and they changed the plans, and I think I was mad because I thought I was going to go to China, which would have been exciting. Could you stop by China for a little bit? No, no, just in India, the Philippines, and Japan. No, they, my, my uh, trunk was already on the ship to go home. 
and they didn't know if they could even get it to me uh, when they sent me into Japan. So it was quite an experience. Wonderful experience. I'd do it again if I were younger. Um, but when did you go home? I went home in uh, January of 1977. 75, 76, 77, yeah. I had two Christmases that year because I crossed the date line on Christmas Day. What was your home? Well, it was it was wonderful because, of course, my mother was gone, but my dad was there, and that was a great thing to see him. I went back to where my brother was living, and my father was living there, and they had a group of people come in to say hello to me, and my sister-in-law served donuts. And then she said, oh, my gosh, why did I serve you donuts? <laughs> and that was funny. So you went in summer of 45 and you got out at 19, 47. 47. And then you got out in 47. I came into California, so I've been around the world with the American Red Cross. Um, what were your days like after you came home? Well, I had to look for a job and, you know, I had to get myself taken care of. I lived at home there with my, in this a small town in South Jersey, and gave a lot of talks, no matter where I've gone. And I've given two or three here when I first came. Now we use the people who were coming in. Did you make any close friends when you were there? Did you keep in touch with anybody? No. Just the Red Cross people that I mentioned earlier. You, but do you still keep in touch with any of them? No, they're gone now. Um, what did you do as a career? What kind of job did you get afterwards? Well, at first I went and worked in a department store to, to get an, an immediate job. And then I was um, hired by Georgetown, which is a Quaker boarding school in Georgetown, Pennsylvania, and I taught there for two years. And then I went on and got a master's degree at the University of Indiana, and then married a fellow that I met there, and have two sons. My husband is gone. I don't know if they'll want any of this or not. Um, how did the, the military experience influence your thinking of wars and the military in general? Well, of course, I was more in the humanity part of it. And and I know that, that, uh, I, that I never heard any shooting until the Second World War when I was in Europe. I was very close to where I could hear shooting. But... Um, they, I know that the, um, they need something like the Red Cross and the Salvation Army because it's another avenue uh, in their life and, and a support for them. Did you join any kind of veterans organizations? No, I worked with the Red Cross, my local Red Cross, for a while. I've lived in Minneapolis and Chicago and here, so the... Um, in the other areas I've worked for, I haven't done anything since I've been here. Did the experience affect your life at all? Oh, I'm sure it has. It's made me much more broad-minded. And I know there are two sides to every question. Is there anything you'd like to add that hasn't been covered in the story? I can't think of anything else that oh when I when I came home I don't know if you want this or not uh, of course in, in when you travel in these foreign countries 
There are all sorts of facilities to go to the bathroom. And even one was like an ice cream chair with um, the seat cut out and the basin was sitting on the ground underneath that was in India. So if I'd run into a clever artist, I would have written a book, John's All Over the World. And I knew a doctor friend in Indiana when I first was married who said we could subtitle it World Relief. I don't think they want that, but I thought you'd enjoy it. <laughs> um, any other stories you could think of? Or? Oh, well, let's see. Let's go back to... Um, let's go back to Japan. When I got there, um, they sent me out to... Um, so not in Sapporo, but we went up to Sapporo. That's where the uh, Olympics were held, you know, so that I've been there too. But uh, there's so many islands there that you can visit, and that was kind of fun. But the, um, trying to think of what the name of that one was, I was going to tell. The temples, I've seen so many temples in all of those countries. And that's principally what I would do, is conduct tours and take... Well, I, I had to learn. I, had, I too had to learn how to drive a 6x6, six six, which is one of those trucks that you see on the highway that have double wheels in the back. That's the six, the four in the back, and the two in the front. I had to learn how to drive one of those because that, that van that we had that we drove to the... Um, replacement depot back there in India was a six by six and we had to learn to drive that. Then um, one time when the, um, oh, this is so personal though, one time when one of the fellows was helping me put the thing up, he almost cut the end off my th finger because I, it got caught in that thing that goes up on the, the um, well, you know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. a food truck. I don't know what you call that shelf or whatever you call it. But anyway, he was helping me close that to go back to where we were located. Oh, I know something I didn't tell you. When I went over to India, they had a house, a very nice house that some of the Red Cross people lived in. But they put us out in a grove in tents so that I slept in what would have been a cook tent for the uh, army, and they had three of us in there. And we had monkeys in that grove that used to come and look into the uh, tent and the flap up there that was for the, the uh, smoke pipe to go out, smoke to go out. And um, they'd look in and sort of look at us. We had to sleep with mosquito nets around our beds and they did, one of them did get into our tent one time and wrecked havoc because they played with the toothpaste and everything they could get a hold of. I'm sure I've left things out. I should have brought one of those talks I gave. Why did they put you in the tent? No room. The house was filled. Yeah. So there were about a dozen of us or more that were out there in that grove. When you gave the tours, did you give them to the soldiers? Yes, of course. That's what we did. Mm -hmm. Only the soldiers. Mm -hmm. oh. I thought we started at 5 after 11. No. All right. Any stories from the soldiers? Well, one story that um, um, happened in Japan, there was one soldier there who used to always sort of seek me out. He wanted to talk to me. And then when he heard I was going home, he said, I want to give you something. And I said, no, I don't want to take any gifts. But one day he came in with a pearl ring 
sat in a very light, almost chromium piece of metal. It was a very cheap looking thing. And he said, I want you to have this. And I said, I don't want to take it. I said, I want you to take it home and give it to your mother or sister or something. He said, my mother has been dead for four years and he threw it at me. So I took the pearl at that point. I had hurt his feelings. And then I did have that reset. I don't have it here with me today. But I did have it reset. That was a very moving experience. And you learn to be very careful of some of the things you say to people, too. But he, uh, he took it the wrong way. And what did he talk? About he, uh, when you talk to the soldiers? Well, he would talk about home. They all want to talk about home and where you're from. And, and that was one of our, our uh, most fun games when we were talking, trying to guess where people came from by their accent and the way they talked. We would guess, and then they would tell us for sure. And, and uh, um, another two games that the soldiers liked to play a lot, they'd like to dare each other that you can't strike there were little, those little paper matchbooks. I'm getting so hoarse. But little paper matchbooks that they have had then can't strike every match immediately with one strike. And the only way you can do it, I learned, was to hold it very close to the tip. So I got so I could win bets with them too because I learned you, you have to get burnt a little bit sometimes to do it. And another thing that I learned from, I didn't do this myself, but I learned they could get each other drunk if they made them drink the beer through a straw and drink it very slowly. They would get so drunk. So those things I don't need to, I didn't need to know. Is there anything else you'd like to add that we didn't cover? I can't think of anything else. Well, EJ, I'd like to thank you for your service and for taking the time to do the interview. Thank you. Have a great day. I don't know if it'll help anybody or do any good, but it was fun. We all like to talk about ourselves. <laughs>